Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. Also, from Holmes, Doyle, and Friends, the annual Sherlock Holmes Symposium in Dayton, Ohio, on March 28th. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 185, William S. Baring Gould. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became a chronicler. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. Your Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jacket office. <laughs> the game's afoot as we discuss goings on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger streeter regulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Well, hello and welcome once again to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And together, we are bearing down on this subject, looking very much forward to talking with Julie McCurris and Tim Johnson about the subject of the 2019 Baker Street Journal Christmas Annual, William S. Baring Gould. Before we do that, just a little bit of housekeeping. The show notes for this episode are available at ihose.co slash ihose185. That's all lowercase. You can also find us at IHearOfSherlock.com. There you can leave us comments. You can give us feedback. You can also donate to the show via PayPal or Patreon to help us keep the lights on and to keep this wonderful programming coming your way. We do appreciate each and every single dollar that you send in, and we put it to good use to continue to produce this show. If you have any comments for us, you can email us at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com. You can pop open the voice recorder on your phone and simply record an MP3 and attach it to that email if you'd like to leave us a voice comment. You can also find us on all of the social networks, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as I Hear of Sherlock. On this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, we're pleased to be joined by two of the four co-editors and authors of the 2020, excuse me, 2019 Baker Street Journal Christmas Annual, Julie McCurris and Timothy Johnson. Julie is the president of the Norwegian, or was president of the Norwegian Explorers, I should say, from 1997 to 2006, and has been actively involved in the Friends of Sherlock Holmes collections at the University of Minnesota Libraries. She edited their newsletter since 1999 and has worked every Explorers Conference since 1998 as co-chair for all but two. You may recall we had Julie on with Gary Thaden in a uh, an episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere last year in the run-up to that conference, and she was on two years ago with fellow co-editor and author of the Baker Street Journal Christmas Annual, uh, Sonia Featherston, for the Baker Street Journal Christmas Annual about Helene Yehoseva. And finally, Julie is um, co-editor of Sherlockian Heresies with Sue Vazoski. You can find her, well... She's she's online and everywhere you need her to be at the conferences and always a friendly face. Julie, welcome back to the program. Well, thank you for uh, hosting us and thank you for the kind words. Uh, I think most of them are true. <laughs> well, we'll find out but soon all enough. Are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> we are also joined by Tim Johnson, the E. W. McDermott curator of the Sherlock Holmes collections at the University of Minnesota since 2010. 
and he was collections consultant for the International Exhibition of Sherlock Holmes. You can find two links related to that opening sentence about Tim. Of course, he was with us, uh, boy, I'm going to say about seven years ago or so. I don't have my my show notes, uh, my archives open in front of me, but he was uh, on an episode. We'll have a link to that. And, uh, of course, the International Sherlock Holmes, we uh, explored that with one of the co-creators uh, about two years ago. Uh, Tim has um, curated a number of Sherlockian exhibits, and he presents Holmes and the collections to any enthusiastic audience that will attend. His published work appears in books and uh, professional and academic journals, blogs, magazines, newsletters, and he's even on Twitter. Tim, welcome back to the program. Thanks, Scott. It's, it's great to be with you. Well, now I I need to advise our listeners that Julie and Tim are only half of the editorial, authorial uh, team of the 2019 Christmas Annual. Uh, The other half includes Richard Sveum and Gary Thaden. Um, That's a lot of authors for a single thin volume like this. Um, Can... Can either one of you explain why it took four people to uh, tackle this subject? I can. Okay. Um, I feel like it took four of us because it was a big story. Hmm. And, uh, you know, exploring someone's life who's been gone for uh, quite a while. And we realized that we each had a strength and particular knowledge. Something, of course, Tim, vitally important because of the resources at the University of Minnesota and his access to them and his own particular research talents. Uh, Gary Thaden is very knowledgeable about the Minneapolis-St. Paul area and the history of some of the business people that were here, which uh, definitely affected Baron Gold's family hmm. as well. He, he's a great proofreader. <laughs> and Dick's fam, for those who know him, is quite the bibliographic expert. And I was willing to take whatever was found, and we all made it work. Well, Julie, I think, undersells herself <laughs> because she she brought so much to the project, too. And uh, one of her strengths is uh, she, in doing family histories and genealogies and making contact uh, with family members. And she brought um, that personal side, that family, that long, rich family history uh, to the story. Um, she is a very accomplished researcher and writer. And so um, we couldn't have done it without her. We couldn't have done it without uh, Dick and Gary. It really was a fun team effort uh, with all of us bringing uh, different aspects, different strengths to the project. Yeah. Uh, you know, it it's funny, you don't usually think things are going to go smoothly when a committee is involved, and yet it sounds like each one of you had your own little niche carved out, and it worked uh, extraordinarily well together. Plus, we like just like each other. We, we hang out together a fair amount, and uh, so it really wasn't too tough to get together and chat and work through uh, what we're going to be finding and writing about. Well, that's great. That's great. And I Well, and another thing is too, I think we defined our own terms in the beginning. Hmm. So we didn't have a whole lot of but I said I would look that up <laughs> or um but I thought you were going to look that up. <laughs> so, you know, we we each knew what we were good at and wanted to do as a part of this project. Yeah. So I think we uh by defining everything we avoided a lot of other problems that committees might run into. That's wonderful. Well, why don't we back up a little bit and explain to listeners who might not know the name, uh, William S. Baring Gould, who was Bill Baring Gould and what did he mean to the world of Sherlock Holmes? Julie, I'll let you well, start out. Well, William S. Baring Gould was a uh, Minneapolis native who attended the University of Minnesota And uh, upon his graduation, moved to New York, where he first worked for Hearst, and then uh, was wooed away to work at 
Time Life magazine. And while living in New York, uh, called back on his interest in Sherlock Holmes that he'd had um, as a young man as he began to read about the Baker Street Irregulars. And apparently he was the type of person that when he was interested in something, he jumped in with both feet. <laughs> um, he had a tremendous amount of energy and knowledge and just a desire to learn more. And so after what time learning frame? about the Irregulars, he attended his first dinner in 1947. Okay. All right. I was just going to ask you about the time frame there from, from when he discovered the Irregulars. Were they already in full formation by the time he moved to New York City? Uh, yes. He, well, I'm not going to say in full formation. They were certainly getting going. Uh, the first real indication I could find, and I don't think uh, Tim found anything to contradict this, was a reference in a letter he wrote. And in that letter to Ernest Bloomfield Zeisler, he, there was a little footnote to Edgar W. Smith talking about a 1944 letter he wrote to Christopher Morley. Hmm. Now, we've never been able to find that original letter, despite our best efforts. But I, with the timing, I think he saw all the publicity that came out about the 1944 trilogy dinner. Ah. And I... I I have a belief that that's really what sparked his interest. Well, and as someone who worked in the publishing industry for Hearst and Time Life, this would have been, uh, you know, right in his wheelhouse. Absolutely. Got it. And, the other uh, when he got involved, he got involved. Yeah. yeah the Tim, other thing that's fascinating to me just about his family is uh, this is a family that uh, you can find reference to in the Doomsday Book. Uh, 1086 uh, and the Lou Trenchard estate. Um, and so there have been ghouls and bearing ghouls um, in that place for centuries. Um, so it's a, it's a family that has a, a rich history. Um, the first time I ever came across the bearing ghoul name was actually not with Bill, but it was with uh, Sabine bearing Gould, who was a folklorist, uh, a rector, in the Church of England, uh, and uh, maybe best known for some of the hymns he wrote, including Onward Christian Soldiers, oh, wow. um, with uh, the the music provided uh, by, uh, I forget if it's Gilbert or Sullivan. Um, but uh, so there's this rich, this rich family history coming out of England, um, situated in the Moors. So this is, this is, uh, uh, you know, Bill would have would have heard his grandfather talking about the Moors, and uh, obviously was familiar with that part of the country. Um, so I'm just I'm just fascinated, uh, in part by by this family history and mm -hmm. and how they end up in in Minneapolis of all places. Yeah how how was that? I mean this is a this is a family that has you know a, a long standing history as you say, Tim, connected to uh, England and the, the the southwest of England. Um, what drew them to Minneapolis, of all places? <laughs> Getting kicked out of I'm the nest. Sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, um, they're, the patriarch there, Sabine Beringold, was quite interested in, in providing support to his daughters should they need it. The boys apparently were encouraged to uh, go out on their own. And I don't know if he actually packed their bags and put them out front. But I got the feeling he, he greatly encouraged them to seek their own fortunes. I'm not sure we ever found out exactly why they came to Minneapolis. Um, the oldest one of the sons settled here. And that was enough then when the younger brother, who was William Beringold's father, when he got kicked out of the nest, he just followed his brother here. And they established themselves quite well here in a very short order. And that was one of the interesting things that Gary Thaden really was able to look into hmm. was the people that they came to work with. You know, these two immigrants were working with some of the best known people and business people in the area, such as, uh, oh gosh, George Pillsbury, uh, Thomas Lowry, 
uh, people who had a real impact on the economy and the cultural institutions that are still established in this area. Mm. Now, I mean, you mentioned the name Pillsbury, obviously, and a household name uh, to many folks. Um, but when when you tramp the streets of Minneapolis today, and you don't run into Sherlockians, and and I'm sure. Uh, it takes a while before you actually uh, run into that situation because there's so many Sherlockians in Minneapolis. <laughs> um, when, when you do that, when you run into someone and you say Baring Gould to them, I mean, to Sherlockians, obviously, we know Baring Gould, you know, a giant in Sherlockian publishing, the father of the annotated Sherlock Holmes, chronologist, etc. But if you said Baring Gould to your average uh, Minnesotan or uh, Minneapolis resident, would they recognize the name? I don't no. think so. No. Okay. Um, many and Apolitans, <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they would not make the connection uh, at all between that name and uh, Sherlock Holmes. And I think the people who do know what role he played in Sherlock Holmes' scholarship still had misconceptions about him. Hmm. Uh, I talked to a number of people who said, well, I, I know they moved there because his father was the British consul in Minneapolis and assumed the family, including William Baring Gould, were English. Hmm. And that, that was not the case. Uh, his father came here, worked in business, and worked for a gentleman who was the vice consul. That gentleman um, died at a fairly young age as a result of the flu epidemic. Uh, in 1919, mm -hmm. and then Baring Gold's father stepped into the role. So there was that misconception that that uh, they were here later than they were, and for a different reason. Part of me wonders too, given the family's earlier association with the East India Company, um, and the the growing. Um, well, it was really the milling industry. Minneapolis was the flower capital of the world. Oh, that, sure. that in some sense, there may have been a business connection or a business interest uh, from the trade or commerce side of things that would have drawn uh, the Bering Goulds to the Twin Cities and and to be engaged as they were with uh, some of the leading members uh, of the city who were involved in real estate development um, and and that kind of thing in, in the early building days of of the city. Uh, Tom, Thomas Lowry uh, fits in with the history of the transit uh, industry. Uh, the Walkers were uh, came out of a lumbering a lumber industry. Um, and we still have the Walker uh, Art Museum here, which is uh, one of the family legacies. Uh, so I, I've I've got to wonder if that East India Company. The involvement with trade and commerce, Minneapolis as a, a new center for an important part of world trade might have might have drawn uh, those young men here to the to the Twin Cities. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. Well, you mentioned, uh, Julie, that when Baring Gould got into something, he really went in with both feet, and and the BSI attracted his attention, and he uh, attended the 1947 dinner. Can you can you walk us through maybe the, that year and the year following that kind of lit this fire under him and um, what the BSI or BSI publications saw out of him in those early days? I think part of it was probably preceded, uh, as I said, by this, this uh, letter to Christopher Morley, which you could tell he was starting to get interested in the formal organization. And I have to wonder, in September of 1946, there was a Harper's Magazine article that he wrote, and, and it was mm. kind of about fan fiction, focusing on science fiction, and the the different things he had to say about the science fiction fans, which... I think much of it can be related to those of us who are great fans of Sherlock Holmes. But he attended his first dinner, as I said, in 1947, 
But then that same year, he published his first article in the, the Baker Street Journal, which hmm. was ha- the first half of the chronology he was working with. Oh, wow. The second half of it appeared the following issue. And I think that must have really brought him to people's attention, that he was working on such a concise chronology. Hmm. Um, he did not attend the 1948 dinner, which many did not. It was an abbreviated group. But he was back at the 1949 dinner. And by 1951, um, Rolf Boswell, who many people know that name, indicated he was their newest chronologist. So I think they saw him as a real up-and-coming writer and enthusiast and student. Hmm. And that, that was his entree. The other, the other interesting kind of Morley connection here is that Christopher Morley came to Minneapolis in 1939 to give a speech on the 50th anniversary of the Minneapolis Public Library. And the director of the library at that time was a phenomenal woman by the name of Gracia Countryman. And Morley began his talk, friends, Romans, and then he paused and looked at Miss Countryman and kind of waited for everybody to fill in the blank. Um, part of me thinks that, you know, Baring Gould would have been aware of that given his Minneapolis connections and it being only a short time after he had left the university to pursue work in New York. Um, and maybe that's what uh, might have also uh, put Morley in his mind and, and triggered that letter. I, I don't know. I just, I love to speculate about stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he certainly maintained his Minneapolis ties. His mother lived here. And until her death in 1958, um, he remained friendly with many of his college friends. And so he visited here quite often. His wife from, was from this area. She had family here. So I don't think it's inconceivable that that could have happened. But, of course, we couldn't put it in because we couldn't document Of that. course. Right. Of course. Right. There is a recording of, I think, Morley's talk. Uh, or at least the text that Gary Gary Thaden uncovered um, when he was sitting on the Hennepin County Library Board. I think he he found that uh, reference and that speech that Morley gave on the 50th anniversary. Hmm. Speaking of recordings, is there any extant recording of Baring Gould himself? There is yeah. one that you can, I think, find online. Uh, where Baring Gould is is uh, making some comments. Um, Julie, jump in. <laughs> you, well, you... Um, I think all of us know that he wrote Sherlock Holmes of Baker Street. And, you know, it was released and people either loved it or hated it. And as happens, he got a lot of correspondence with people expressing both points of view. And I believe at the January 1963 Baker Street Irregulars dinner, he gave a talk that was recorded, and it was about all of the negative press he received. And it was so funny and so self-deprecating with the comments that in, included things about, you know, people weeping. They were so sad to hear this sad tale. <laughs> So I, I believe that that can be found. I know I've listened to it. I think I found it on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a link to it here on YouTube, and um, well, we'll just we'll, we'll pause here and listen to a couple of minutes from it. I'd like to have you bask with me in some of the glow of critical acclaim which has been cast on this book for virtually every place. Let's begin. It was properly reviewed in the in the Good Gray New York Times and How We Miss It by none other than old irregular Tony Boucher, who said, and I quote him, "quote wretched proofreading." Uh, another old irregular, Rolf Boswell, was equally kind. He uh, he said, doubtless there will be disagreements of plenty. And Bill Raby was 
terribly quick to second that, I felt. He said in the Detroit News of Sunday, May 13th, Sherlockian scholars may quarrel with Baring Gould's explanation of Dr. Watson's wandering wound. They will certainly dispute his report that Sherlock Holmes simply died of old age on a Sussex park bench. <laughs> now, going north to S. Tupper Bigelow land, we find that the Toronto Globe and Mail of May 2nd said, a fantastic exercise in imaginative nonsense. <laughs> The, uh, the Vancouver Globe says, Mr. Baring Gould tends to carry things just a bit too far. <laughs> Imagination boggles. <laughs> but it is, it is really when we cross the seas that we find criticism rising to its finest heights. And I think I'll just begin with the Irish news of October 27th, fanciful. The Birmingham Post of September 18th, irritating. <laughs> the Sunday Telegraph of September 16th, unscrupulous. <laughs> the Manchester Guardian of September 27th, tongue-in-the-cheek audacity. <laughs> John O. London's Weekly, Mr. Baring Gould does not play fair. <laughs> Books and Bookman, Mr. Richard Whittington Egan. I like him. He says, absurd mythology, bogus biography. One is tempted to slap the volume down with that irascibility that Watson displays in a study in Scarlet as he flings aside the magazine containing an unsigned article by Holmes with the remarks, what ineffable twaddle. <laughs> The Manchester Evening News of September 27th. The joke is well illustrated. <laughs> <laughs> and a paper from some place, I can't read my own typing, it's from some little town, it's the Independent. The profuse footnotes, footnotes contained in this book do not make for smooth reading. <laughs> and the Illustrated London News, one I'm particularly proud of, says Mr. Baring Gould is an American. <laughs> <laughs> the London Times, no doubt Mr. Baring Gould knows Holmes' methods. It is a pity that he does not apply them. <laughs> well, that's wonderful to hear uh, to hear his voice come alive for us. I mean, so many of these these figures of old and the beginning of the uh, the, the Sherlockian movement, uh, whether it's Edgar Smith, Christopher Morley, uh, even Vincent Sterrett, um, there are still recordings of their voices around. They're, they're not widely known or widely circulated, but to be able to find those and hear them, it really, it, it just adds an additional perspective to, you know, these otherwise two-dimensional uh, giants that we know. Exactly. I think that's a really good point because, you know, if you listen to this particular recording, his humor comes through. Yeah. And in the research I did, and if you don't mind, I'll go backtrack a little bit. Please. I went to New York and went to the New York Historical Society and went through the Time Life archives. And in that research was able to find the copies of the speeches he gave while he was an employee. And those speeches focused on direct mail advertising, such as, you know, sending out a blast, what we would consider a blast email now, but letters to people encouraging them to subscribe to any of the Time Life publications. And it's hard for us to imagine that those speeches could be funny, but they were. They, they were funny. They were well written. Uh, it, it would just, when you read them, you get another sense of who he was and how he handled himself professionally. Yeah, and you know it's funny. I uh, I think it was last December or so. Uh, I wrote uh, a piece on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere about uh, some of the influences that Edgar Smith would have had as he was up and coming. And there was a uh, a paragraph, and I don't remember whether it was from John Lellenberg's uh, BSI archival website or whether it was from one of the uh, BSI history books, uh, where it was talking about uh, Smith's 
uh, abilities as a speechwriter for General Motors and and how talented he was. And this is among uh, people who are considered masters of the craft. Uh, so to hear someone like Smith and someone like Baring Gould um, in very similar kinds of circles. I mean, obviously, uh, Baring Gould is working in the publishing industry, Smith uh, in the auto industry, but that they were so facile with uh, with words, both written and spoken, I think uh, kind of speaks to this this ability that so many Sherlockians have, this erudition, this uh, ease with each other and with themselves. Uh, and I think it speaks volumes to the types of people that we attract. I wow, I feel like I'm in good company now. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in the Bering Gould home uh, watching Bill go to work because he was not one who, who spent a lot of time watching television, although he did make a couple of pitches uh, to uh, to tell the truth. And I think what's my line in terms of possible episodes they might do. Um, but he, he had so many different irons in the fire or balls in the air and was always working on something. And I, uh, that must have been just a beehive of activity uh, in his study, his mm. den, in his home, uh, and to just watch him read, write, do all the things that he was doing. Uh, he had a very active life. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm... And, and he often traveled for business. Right. In, in doing these these speeches, and you know, one would look at a early 1950s family. And I think we all think of the old uh, television shows where, you know, mother stayed home, mother took care of this while father went out and, and worked. And Baron Gould's wife, Seal, was also incredibly active in different things. Uh, together, they were active in the local theater group. Uh, they were active in a homeowners group. She was active in the League of Women Voters. And in addition to the various interests that focused on their home and their family, they they were reaching out to others as well. And mm. I think Tim's correct. It must have just been a really fascinating hive. Yeah. Well, to, I mean... To see them pursuing all this. Right. I mean, in, in many ways, they sound like, uh, you know, the, the original power couple uh, of sorts. <laughs> Uh, that they they each were very uh, proficient at what they did and well respected and well liked. Um, and I remember meeting Seal Baring Gould, uh, oh boy, probably in the mid to late nineties at a BSI uh, weekend. She she was still around at the time, and uh, was you could tell at that point even how uh, how much people liked her and and welcomed her. Um, and I think, and, and it, I think they respected I, her. Yeah, and I think it rubbed off on the children too. I mean, I, I'm just I'm really touched by that uh, sketch of Barry Gould that was done by his son uh, that we were able to include. Um, you know, here was a young man uh, whose life was tragically cut short in an automobile accident and mm. was headed to the Rhode Island School of Design, and you look at that that sketch of his father and you just think of the potential um, that, that was there and, and the beauty of that sketch of, of his father. Um, For me, that's one of the most touching uh, pieces in, in the annual. Um, And again, it speaks to a very active family.
Well, Tim, you, you touched on something uh, earlier when you were giving Julie her uh, due credit at the beginning of the interview when you spoke about her ability uh, with genealogy. And, and Julie, this is something that we ran across in the Helene Yehoseva Christmas Annual two years ago as you and Sonia were embarking on uh, that issue, you know, you did a lot of research and, and she didn't have a lot of family. There, there were a few, uh, distant relatives, nieces, I think, uh, were involved. Right. Um, and, and I would imagine, uh, you did the same kind of due diligence here with William Baring Gould. Can you tell us a little bit about, uh, his family's involvement with, uh, the, the Christmas annual and, and, and your approach and, and what you were able to find? Oh, I'd be happy to, because I have nothing but glowing things to say about the family. Uh, I was able to locate his daughter, and about a year and a half ago, my husband and I visited with her, and as gracious as everyone always described her mother, I think they would speak in the same terms about her. She uh, welcomed us into her home. She was so excited that people still remembered her father because oh. she was young enough when he passed away that she, I don't think she had a very, um, very good idea of what an impact he'd had. So to find out everyone in, involved in Sherlock Holmes knows his name, knows his accomplishments, and still lauds him for that work was, I think, a wonderful thing for her to learn. And she was... I keep going back to the word gracious, but generous with saying, you know, I've got some pictures together for you. You know, how can I help you? And answering all the questions that we posed to her. And I was really struck by the fact that I don't know that we could have gotten nearly as much done without her cooperation mm. and and her encouragement. Now, so. When, when you think about all of the projects that Baring Gould was involved in, Sherlockian and non-Sherlockian, uh, and uh, let, let's just take his, his chronology alone. I mean, this is something that in and of itself uh, probably took a number of months and perhaps even years to, uh, to accumulate. And he was, he was always making corrections, right? He had his initial chronology and then the chronology that appeared in uh, Sherlock Holmes of Baker Street, and then the final chronology that he put together for the annotated Sherlock Holmes. Uh, and, and let's face it, the annotated Sherlock Holmes is no uh, small work either. Um, <laughs> did did she have any recollection or any uh, stories to tell about this massive research organization that was her father uh, within their own home? Uh, she didn't have a lot to say about that. I, I got the feeling that although he was always working on something and he would kind of, I don't want to say isolate it, but go into his den and would work on things, there was always something going on in that. Hmm. But he didn't talk a lot about it. Huh. You know, I think he was pretty pretty good about the idea that when he did have time with his children, he talked to them Yeah. about what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. You do get a sense, though, too, that uh, kind of like Philip and Mary Hench, that Bill and Seal were a team. She was doing some some of his research for him, too. And I think there's a place in the annual where we talk about, you know, he's he finding a stack of, of material that she had put together ready for him to go through. Um, mm. So you get a sense that this was, this was in some ways a partnership uh, um, of, of great love for this subject between the two of them. And then they both, both brought some interesting things to whether it was the limericks or the mother goose or the annotated Sherlock Holmes that uh, it seal was there too mm. uh, helping out. Now, and encouraging. I think she was always very encouraging. Right. Yeah. Right. Now, Seal was eventually honored as the woman uh, during the BSI weekend. Now, this is this is a tradition that goes back uh, some decades. Uh, certainly before women were invited to the dinner, uh, there was always one honored at the cocktail party prior to the dinner. 
Uh, and, and typically it is a, uh, a, a spouse of a, a Sherlockian who is doing great things, doing things for the organization, doing things for, uh, Sherlock Holmes and, and the spouse is recognized in the role that they have, uh, as a support, as a bulwark, as, um, you know, in, in some uh, cases, a, uh, a, a, a companion in arms. Um, when do, do, do you, do you have it at hand when Seal actually became, um, part of that process? Well, she is the, she is the woman in 1969. Right. That's- Thank you. That's I the dinner. Remember if it was sixty-eight or sixty-nine. Yeah, okay. sixty-nine is sixty-nine is is when William, Mrs. William S. Baring Gould, an un- unusually gracious lady, hmm. uh, was toasted as the woman. So, nineteen sixty-nine. This was two years after the publication of the annotated Sherlock Holmes, if I recall correctly. Yeah, Correct. It was published in. Late 1967. Can you talk to us about the time frame leading up to that publication, um, what was going on and, and what eventually sadly happened? Well, part of it was negotiating and corresponding um, because, again, I think he had a number of projects in the works at the time, uh, um, the Nero Wolf thing, I think, was also uh, something he was working on. So part of it was, first of all, to find who might publish the annotated. And Adrian Conan Doyle was very clear that he did not want uh, one particular publisher to have anything to do with it. Um, Bill was hoping Doubleday uh, would come through. They decided not to. Um, so part of it was the search for a publisher. Um, part of it was a long correspondence back and forth with Adrian, um, because once Bill had the manuscript in hand, he, sh- he shared that with Adrian, uh, and Adrian wrote a number of letters in reply, including one that was a six pager. Uh, full of full of uh, observations and comments. I mean, Adrian generally very complimentary to Baring Gould and his work. Um, he makes some interesting observations about other folks like uh, Hesketh Pearson or Irving Wallace. Uh, their names slipping into into the work, and Adrian would rather not see them there. Um, so there's there's the publisher issue. Um, there's getting Adrian's blessing and signing off because he's the last one representing the Conan Doyle estate who needs to sign off uh, on the project. Um, and then um, it's the timing of it in terms of trying to get it out uh, in time for for people to buy for Christmas. Mm. Um, so. And Julie might have some other things that were kind of in play at the time, but those are the ones that I remember. Um, you know, Clarkson Potter eventually does publish it uh, in the States. Um, well, I, I think that's a good jumping off point. If we look at like 1960 on, I have no idea how this man accomplished everything that he did. <laughs> uh, you know, he's, he was working on... Um, the Sherlock Holmes of Baker Street, you know, the American edition came out, and he was he did a lot of work with British publishers for uh, an edition from there. And in December of 61, uh, going from the correspondence that the university holds, he's indicating that Clarkson Potter wanted him to do an annotated Mother Goose as a companion to Martin Gardner's hmm. annotated Alice. He, he wrote another manuscript. It was called The Naked Mountain, about the eruption of Mount Pelee in Martinique in the Caribbean, and couldn't, couldn't get it published. But by 1962, he started talking about writing a book that he would need the cooperation of Adrian Conan Doyle. So, you know, that you, you start to see that. You start to see a, a 1960 letter that... T.S. Blakeney wrote to him saying that Edgar Smith told him that Bill might be starting an annotated. Hmm. So I think this project was percolating 
for a number of years before okay. he actually started work on it. Um, in 1962, the British Sherlock Holmes edition came out. The uh, Sherlock Holmes of Baker Street. Bill was made a member of the Mystery Writers of America. Uh, he was very pleased in 1963. He went to England and met with many British Sherlockians and got a nice tour of Baker Street. And the contact that Tim was talking about with Adrian, uh, the first letter we could find was in February of 1964. Okay. And, and Adrian replied he thought the idea for an annotated was just wonderful, but really, shouldn't we really focus on his father instead of Sherlock Holmes? Yeah. <laughs> you know, none of this literary agent stuff. Mm. This was, this was the, the man. So uh, as, as Tim mentioned, they started hunting for a publisher, and as uh, he said, he hoped it was Doubleday, and he certainly knew who he hoped it wouldn't be. So uh, in May of 64, he, he did took the story, The Abbey Grange, and did an annotated version of that to show it to Clark, Clerks and Potter and say, this is what we can do. And Potter wanted to use the John Murray plates and was really, even in May 64, talking about a 1965 publishing date. Wow. But uh, that that didn't happen. That didn't happen. And by 66, it's, that's the six-page letter that Tim referenced. And it was one of those letters that, that began with, you know, how great everything Bill did was wonderful. But really, you need to improve that part about my dad <laughs> and not talk so much about other people. And so there were a lot of uh, changes that had to be made before that contract was actually finalized. So, yeah, Ray, Bill had to. He had to. Yeah, Bill had to rewrite the first chapter because that was the mm -hmm. part that that uh, dealt with ACD, and then send that over to Adrian. Um, <laughs> well, I I seem to re recall in the annual reading that uh, you know he did make some changes, but uh, as as uh, adrenaline kept writing back um, <laughs> and, and kept being insistent on some areas. Uh, eventually, Bill just uh, basically gave a, a polite nod and did what he wanted to anyway. It, am I recalling that correctly? Yeah, and I think the, I think the, so. one, the one thing in particular is with the, uh, the picture of Joseph Bell ah. um, where uh, – Bill left the caption in um, the original. The original, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which uh, adrenaline would not have <laughs> wanted to see. <laughs> right, right. I th I think he made some of the changes he requested, but on others he stood firm. Right. Yep. Right. So I I think you know we would look at it as a good negotiation and a good compromise. Yeah. We're going to take another brief pause here for a word from our other sponsor. It seems like there are more and more Sherlockian conferences and symposia to attend with every passing year. And that's a great thing. But it's difficult for Sherlockians to make that choice because of geography, travel expenses, and simply the calendar filling up. There's only so much time and money a Sherlockian can devote to some of these conferences. Well, if you have some free time, at the end of March 2020, there's one conference, symposium, gathering that we highly suggest you take the time to go to, and that is the Holmes Doyle and Friends Symposium in Dayton, Ohio. This year's edition takes place on Saturday, March 28th, with the opening reception on Friday, March 27th. Speakers this year include Carlina De La Cova on matters anthropological and medical, Denny Dobry on building a reconstruction of 221B. You've heard Denny on the show here before. Al Shaw is going to talk about pipes in the canon. Pat Ward on the Basil Rathbone films and their other B-movie competition. Karen Wilson will regale us with something musical, and our own Burt Wolder will talk about the beautiful writing of Arthur Conan Doyle. 
Expect this and much more. To register, just see the link in the show notes for Holmes, Doyle, and Friends, or just Google Holmes, Doyle, and Friends 2020. What is familiarly known as the Dayton Symposium has been held under various names since 1981, except for a single one-year hiatus in 2013. The Agra Treasurers, who are the Dayton-based Science Society of the BSI, assumed sponsorship of the symposium and adopted the current name in 2014, and since then it's been a blockbuster every year. So get out your calendar, get out your checkbook, it really doesn't cost that much. Go to the link on our show notes for Holmes, Doyle, and Friends, and make sure you make a beeline to Dayton this March. Well, and, and given, uh, you know, as you mentioned before, the sense of humor that Bill seemed to have, certainly in his professional life, you, you have to imagine that that would have carried over into uh, these various hobbies and in dealing with people on a regular basis, that he, he must have had some kind of good humor about him uh, <laughs> regardless. He, you know, he did, and but I think it's also important to remember that in the in the midst of all this, is when they lose their son in that automobile accident, oh, yeah. um, um, and so he's got to, you know, regroup, deal with his grief, um, and uh, but you know, within I think months he's back at it again. Well, was, was there any indication that? He retreated into some of his side projects as kind of a salve for uh, the loss of his son, or, or was it, as you say, did he did he drop everything and just kind of go into a period of mourning? You know what? Well, what his, his, good, I, I was going to say his son died at, toward the end of February of 1966, and it was a one-car auto accident. Mm. But Bill did not appear to have gone back to work right away. Mm. I think he took some time off. And um, in one letter I read, he talked about a planned trip to, to England, mm -hmm. that he knew he and his wife needed to get away. So they, they bought a Triumph car, a TR4, and they picked it up in England and they traveled around England and ended up shipping the car home. And I, I don't know if that was just a good focus for him. Uh, you know, it's kind of in that same time period that he's still doing more articles for the Baker Street Journal and thinking about the book, Nero Wolf. And I think those were projects that gave him some focus and maybe some solace. And the letters that he received from his friends in the Irregulars on the passing of his son must have been quite comforting. Mm. You know, so many people thought about him. So all I, I can say is this was a man who bought two sports cars during his life. <laughs> and he had a red MG, <laughs> and he had a Triumph TR4. <laughs> now, personally, being married to somebody who, when I met him, had a Triumph TR6 and now has a 1980 MG, I understand this. <laughs> 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 oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, so the, the, the project was uh, nearing completion in 1967, and uh, suddenly we lose William S. Baring Gould. It, it, this was a, a rather sudden thing. He was a fairly young man at the time uh, as well, wasn't he? Yes. Yes. Uh, just right around 54. My goodness. You know, and it was a period where he was really involved with the BSI. He was very involved and supportive of the women who were interested in becoming members, such as, you know, Evelyn Herzog has a really touching passage in this Christmas annual yeah. about everything he meant to them, and how supportive he was, and how absolutely crushed they were when they lost their friend. So, uh, you know, even earlier in that year, he was still you know, trying to travel and check sources and footnotes for the annotated. Mm. And his death was was sudden, 
but you know, in retrospect, you look at somebody who is leading such a frenetic lifestyle and was a, a very heavy smoker. Mm. And he had a he had a ruptured aneurysm. Wow! And was gone in a few days. Did so? Did, did he unfortunately have... that left his? Uh, sorry, excuse me. I, I was going to ask: did, Was there a family history there? Where, if his father passed away? Uh, at an early age, did did he know something like his, this was coming? He his father did pass away. I think he was maybe in his early forties, forty one or forty two. Oh I think, my goodness, something like that. Oh. But his um, and this, uh, when I talked to Baring Gold's daughter, she said, "I'm not sure exactly what happened to my grandfather," hmm. and. That was something we were able to solve for. Uh, Gary Thaden was able to find the death certificate. Hmm. And his father had a what they assumed to be a ruptured duodenal ulcer oh, wow. and a hemorrhage. So, yes, there was a history of the men in the family dying young, but different causes. Do, do you get a sense, though, as, as, you, as you've gone through this... A tremendous amount of work that Baring Gould did in such a short period of time that this this frenetic pace that he had uh, was trying to squeeze in as much as he could before uh, before leaving us. I don't know if it's that so much as it that he he just had a zest for life and a an insatiable curiosity and. I mean, you look back at his college career uh, and even in high school. Um, he's going to the movies, he's going to shows, he's writing about them. He uh, explores uh, his talents as a cartoonist. He uh, edits a humor magazine. Um, he's interested in journalism uh, as well as business. Um, uh, he has so many different interests. So I, I'm not so sure it's, it's this sense of impending doom as it's just... He he is interested in so many things uh, and and just wants to engage fully in them. Well, I, that, and, and I think he had a great sense of curiosity mm-hmm. about many things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as Tim was saying, all the involvement he had in so many different activities when he was in school. But when he moved to New York, he remained very active with the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. You know, often speaking for them and maintaining ties while he was pursuing all the other uh, avenues of his interest. So I, I think Tim is on to something with the fact that this was an intelligent, curious man. There's and a yeah, there's a it box just led of him ma- down so many paths. There's yeah. a box of materials that I came across after we we put the annual to bed, um, and I don't know that we could have used it anyway, but I'm still puzzling about it. In fact, a friend of mine over lunch as I was walking around campus talked about this box as the puzzling bearing Gould because it's, it's full of papers that are all about puzzles and words huh. and lists of the most common two-letter combinations and three-letter combinations and four-letter combinations and chess problems. And, you know, I'm really curious uh, about this box of papers that we didn't explore as hmm. as part of the project. But I think it's it's another part of his curiosity about how language works and how words function and how you build them into crossword puzzles yeah. and, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's fascinating. So while he's interested in things like that, he also wanted to write an article about people who went over Niagara Falls in a barrel. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you have the the things that you consider, you know, a really mathematical or intellectual puzzle, along with just things that are current events. Yeah. Yeah. Now, and 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 it was such a big picture of everything that interested him. Yeah. And he seemed to pursue every one of them with the same drive. Well, you know, it's funny because this is something that I think we come across in in the world of Sherlockians is that Sherlock Holmes obviously is the thing that brings us all together and yet uh each person is like an onion. You know, you you begin to peel back the layers and there's so many other things there. Uh and and in in some ways we are all um 
you know, generalists. Uh, I mean, we do deep dives in some areas, uh, but you know, there are there are people who. Um, I don't, I don't know, uh, who uh, are Titanic buffs or who are experts on, uh, you know, railways and train spotting. Um, you mentioned uh, earlier, in, just in passing there, uh, Baring Gould's interest in Nero Wolf. You know, there, there are a number of Sherlockians that kind of cross uh, both of those uh, streams, as it were. Can, can you talk a little bit about Baring Gould and, and where his interest in Nero Wolf took him? Go ahead, Tim. Well, uh, I was I was just looking for that section in the annual because it's one part of his his story that uh, that I don't know as well. But I I think it's um, you know it's this same interest in a character's biography and another version of playing the game, um, and you know so when his book. Nero Wolf of West 35th Street comes out, which again is posthumously uh, published. Um, I, I think he's got that same kind of tongue firmly in cheek playing the game um, and just enjoying exploring the possibilities with an, another literary character. Yeah. And, and of course, Nero Wolf, created by fellow Baker Street irregular Rex Stout. Do we have any record of correspondence between Baring Gould and Stout? Ah, uh, off the top of my head. I don't think so. I, I don't, yeah. Um, I gotta believe that. doesn't mean there weren't. That doesn't mean there weren't conversations between the two of them. True. But True. Uh, I didn't find any correspondence. Are they at a dinner t- or together? Seems like I have a recollection that, you know, whether it's it's him, Rex Stout, or, you know, his. the other thing that popped into mind, too, is this interest that, that is there early uh, with science fiction. And mm. I'm wondering what kind of conversations he might have had if he had them with somebody like Isaac Asimov. Yeah, Paul Anderson. Um, and Paul yeah. Anderson, yeah. yeah. Man- Manly Wade Wellman? Yeah. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Well, so, that's fascinating. you know, a, a man of many interests who was not willing to put any of them on the sidelines. Yeah. And what were... What were some of the reactions? You, you already mentioned the reaction of, of his fellow Baker Street Irregulars of the death of his son. What was the reaction of the Irregulars upon Baring Gould's passing? I just don't think any of them saw it coming. Hmm. So I think, you know, the first thing I would say is they were shocked. They were, they just, they just did not expect to see this happen hmm. uh, to one so young. Yeah, and there were many. You know, the the stand upon the terrace for him is quite touching. And uh, again, I just keep going back to the fact that they were they they still thought he had so much to do and so much to offer. Yeah, and the the sense that he was taken far too young. Yeah, in that standalone, where they say, as far as the irregulars are concerned. Bill needs no physical monument. He will always remain in our minds and hearts. Um, yeah, they di- they didn't see it coming. It was shock and grief um, because here was a life cut short that that obviously had so many other things he wanted to pursue. Yeah. Um, well, and. I mean, certainly his his name lives on. Uh, you know, the, his original annotated still stands the test of time, and and you can still find copies out there, um, in in used bookstores on ABE Books, etc. Um, I, I remember the first version of <laughs> of the annotated Sherlock Holmes I got was a single volume edition, which ah. is you know pretty hefty. It's handy. Um, because you know you, you never know which v- of the of the two volumes to pull out as you're looking for a story because of course they're in Baring Gould's chronological order and you don't know which volume they land in so it's helpful right. to have that single volume but um never never 
try to read that book in bed because if you fall asleep, <laughs> you're, you're you're done for. You're done for. I went to sleep and woke up with a broken nose. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. Well, and there's a little bit of trivia that I, I, I don't know the answer to either, but I, I'm curious that the American edition was in a green dust jacket mm -hmm. and that when John Murray brought it out, the British edition was in red dust jackets. Interesting. And I, I, I don't know why the difference. Huh. Now, I here's, just, here's a question for you. Of all the copies of the annotated, I've seen available for sale. I have never seen a first edition. Ah, uh, there are also pirates. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Talk about that. Um, the one that I've seen was printed, I want to say Singapore. Uh, don't quote me on that exactly, but it was somewhere in that part of the world um, uh, was a, a pirated edition um, of the two volume American green jacketed edition. Um, and I don't know that anyone's really explored, um, done, done some research into that, the pirates. And, and maybe it's only that one that was a pirated mm -hmm. edition. Um, but I, okay. they're out there. Do, do you know? There's your next project. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Do you know what size run there was for the first printing of the annotated? Oh, I I don't. I not off the top of my head, no. Okay. Uh my my guess is that it would have been fairly limited in nature um because they immediately went to uh, second printings. Uh, I mean, I yeah, given given, you know, the runs that they were doing for his other Earlier books, I mean, they were not huge runs. I think one of them was uh, a run of 500, mm. which quickly sold out, and they had to do a, a second printing. Um, but I haven't come across, I'm sure it's it's somewhere in the record, uh, what the run was for the, the first printing of, of the annotated. Mm. I, w I would agree with Tim, because not only did they probably feel they were going to be looking at a pretty small niche market, but it would have been a big, expensive book to yeah. publish. Yeah, no doubt. Well, as we as we wrap up here, um, Julie, in the copious research that you did and speaking with Gold's family, um, what's the thing about him that you were the most surprised to find out throughout this entire process? I'm not going to say I was really surprised, but what came through to me with every letter of his that I read and the speeches that I read and the discussions that I had with, you know, the very few people who knew him that I was able to speak to was just his, his humor and his failure apparently to brag about himself. <laughs> You know, when people, one person wrote to him, for instance, and said, you've made him, why didn't you include this in your book? And his answer was sheer ignorance. <laughs> you know, so he was, he was just always so gracious to anyone who wrote to him, whether it was, you know, a compliment, whether it was a criticism, whether it was a question, that I walked away thinking, this is someone that I think we all miss that we didn't get to know. Hmm. And, and Tim, yeah. as, as you've been so uh, close with uh, the collection and, and so much of what uh, Baron Gould deposited there, or his family deposited there, uh, what, what did you come across that made you raise your eyebrows? I think the thing that surprised me the most and uh, gave me some pleasure was how active he was both at the university's high school, but also as a student here at the University of Minnesota. Um, you know, it's one of those, I guess, 
I want to claim him because we're both graduates of this institution. Uh, and, uh, he played such a, uh, interesting and active role in some of the, the history of the university that's happening at also a very interesting time in the early days into the mid part of the depression. Um, uh, so thinking about him in that context as a college student and what he was doing, um, uh, I found delightful. And when I came across that picture of him seated in the editor's chair with his feet up, um, that one just brought a smile to my face. Uh, so it was, it was, the discovery of, of a very rich life as a student here at the university, I think that was, was both surprising um, and also very pleasing um, to see how he put his mark on this place and um, how in some ways it's come full circle to have his papers here and to be able to celebrate uh, his life as a, as a Sherlockian. You know, I should add something. There was something that surprised me now that I think about it. <clears throat> and that was the fact that, you know, I only looked at him in the beginning as someone who had made such a mark on the study of Sherlock Holmes. And perhaps wrongfully thought at, you know, some level that that was his only big interest. And it was very interesting to find out how wrong I was about that that he was interested in limericks and Mother Goose and his family background, how that influenced him in folklore, and how he pursued it all. Uh, he, he was such a well-rounded person, mm. as opposed to a hyper-focused one. And another thing that I just have to add, because it was such a pleasure for me to read this, is we asked Les Klinger, who had done his own annotated Sherlock Holmes, about how he felt about Baron Gould and what his influence was. And he said that one of the things beside the fact that he did it before computers and didn't have the DeWall bibliography to go by, he didn't have his own annotated to use as a starting point like Les did. So it, to me it just indicated that level of respect that everyone still has for him. And even if they have tried to emulate some of what he did, they still honor him and probably will always do so. And I, I hope they do. And, you know, as, as much as we feel sadness for not having known uh, Baring Gould in our own lifetimes and certainly in our own Sherlockian uh, lifetimes, uh, thanks to you, Julie and Tim and, and of course, uh, Dix VM and Gary Thaden. Uh, everyone else now has the opportunity to see this well-rounded individual, this giant in the world of Sherlock Holmes, who gave so much of himself to our world and to so many others. So we thank you for creating this wonderful story, Bering Gould of Baker Street, The Life and Footprints of William S. Bering Gould. And we thank you for sharing your stories with us here on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Well, thank you, and I'd like to extend uh, my appreciation to the publishers, who I think did a spectacular job with both the cover and uh, allowing us to go our own way with where we thought this story had to go. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much for... Uh allowing us the chance to share a little bit more about uh, someone who's very, very special uh, to our, our joint interest in Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. I'm so sorry that I missed... This conversation, but it's terrific to listen to it. And there's so much going on there. I mean, on the one hand, you know, you could say from a contemporary American perspective that this is the imprint of Minnesota on Baring Gould, you know, Garrison Keeler and other 
writers have kind of chronicled this part of the Midwest as populated by people for whom their own skills and their own talents, you know, are no big deal. And they weren't brought up to boast about what they could do well, or and they weren't brought up to think of themselves as having any great talent. In fact, they were brought up to think of themselves as pretty much that, no big deal, you know, that it's it's best to be quiet about that. But there's a lot of other a lot of other things going on there. You know, you could say how unique Baring Gould was because he also had this British DNA. You know, it's not usual for someone in America to grow up also with a sense of strong family ties to England, particularly with his own heritage. And then the last part of it is he was a Boy Scout. <laughs> and the lovely thing about scouting, you know, particularly in those very early days, and you have to think about this from the standpoint of when Bill Baring Gould was a Boy Scout, I would gather that uh, Baden Powell, who founded scouting in England, was probably could well have been still living when Bill Baring Gould was a Boy Scout. And that comes through in, in the Christmas annual. But the lovely thing about scouting is that you figure out at an early age how to get things done with people of, of your own age, how to form a team and form a group and, and work in a troop and things like that. And that's a big part of scouting for women and for men and boys and for girls. And, uh, um, and that really sort of set him apart. And so you can imagine that when he gets to university and he finds that there are fraternities and, and there are these organizations that produce newsletters that unlike a lot of other kids, you know, he's had that experience and he's, you know, much more equipped to um, handle it productively. Yeah. But um, yeah. it's, it's just a wonderful, it's a wonderful lens into a bygone era. It is. And, you know, as much as there was in this conversation and as much as there was in the Christmas annual, uh, there is so much more to William S. Baring Gould. And I, I feel like this this booklet was a good start, but I feel like there's so much more if we wanted to go deep on any one of the subjects that we've talked about on him. Uh, you know, I had to cut some things out of our our conversation. Uh, but uh, we do have an Easter egg at the end of the show, so stay tuned for that. It actually involves scouting, so you'll get a kick out of that. Oh, great. Well, those strains mean we need to scout our way over to the canonical couplet section of the show. That's right, it's everyone's favorite Sherlockian quiz program, where we ask you a question about the Sherlock Holmes stories phrased in the form of a couplet. That's right, a two-line poem that has something to do with Sherlock Holmes. We put this line or these two lines out there, and if you are among the people who guess correctly, you have an opportunity to win a prize. And we did promise you last time, and perhaps we didn't do it in the show, I think we may have sent it out on social media, that the prize for uh, last week's canonical couplet is a tie from Bowties Limited of Vermont. Uh, the folks that were kind enough to come on the show, Cy Tall there, uh, we're going to give this week's winner a bow tie. So, <laughs> let's recall what the canonical couplet was. The most flint-hearted reader utters yelps when told of what afflicted Tadpole Phelps. Bert, do you know which Sherlock Holmes story we're referring to in this canonical couplet? Yes, that was the terrible adventure of the seaman with the strained abdomen. That was the naval truss, wasn't it? <sighs> uh, I'm going to have to truss you up one of these days, I think. <laughs> Uh, no, no, you are very close once again, though. It was the Naval Treaty. 
Oh, my goodness. Of course, the other one. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, we're going to give the big prize wheel a spin here and watch it go round and round and watch as it slows down and lands on number 15, number 15. And that corresponds to Rich Chris Kunis. Rich, local here in Detroit. Congratulations. I'll be sure to get you your own bow tie, limited uh, ASAP. And now it's time for this week's canonical couplet. Are you ready? Here yes. we go. Do you ken John Clay in his dark room safely hid? That's a lot more than Jabez Wilson did. If you know the answer to this canonical couplet, jot it down in an email addressed to comment that I hear of Sherlock.com with canonical couplet in the subject line. If you are among the correct answers and we select you, you may win a prize. Good luck. Boy, that's pretty easy, that one. Well, one would think, but I never underestimate you, Bert. <laughs> Well, you mentioned John Clay. It's got to be about golems. I mean, don't you make golems out of clay? I just need to just go back to the canon. I'll figure it out. Something related to tennis. It must be. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we do have another exciting episode lined up for you in a fortnight's time. And since it's February, we're going, we're going to, well, we're going to do a bargain, right? We're going to give you the following episode. One day early, because that's the kind of guy that I am. That's the kind of guy that Bert is. I know, right? Shouldn't, shouldn't this be like like Pirates of Penzance, and we get to skip and not do another episode for four years or something like that? Oh, I like that. I like that. But I'm afraid our our listeners would not like that. Mm, well, it's well. True. If you do like the show, here's a reminder to leave us a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts doesn't matter whether you have an iPhone or not. You can still go on there and leave us a rating or review. We appreciate it. And as always, we welcome your contribution to the show's uh, financial side. It helps us with email and web hosting costs and sound hosting and putting the transcripts together. And we're getting caught up on transcripts now, so that's exciting. Thank you to everyone who helps out in that regard. Well, in the meantime, I am the always transcribed Scott Monty. And I am the heavily carbon papered Bert Wolder. And together we say the, the game's afoot. <laughs> the, the game's afoot. <laughs> I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I am neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be my dear fellow. Very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. You know, some of the stories he told, and there's one we tell in the, the annual about, you know, when he was a, a Boy Scout. God, and I love that picture of him in the Boy Scout uniform. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not wearing glasses yet, which, you know, he had very poor eyesight. Yeah, I know. Kept him out of the armed services. Thank goodness, uh, for our sake. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But, you know, how the the woman put the snake in front of his face. <laughs> said, do you, do you know if this is poisonous? <laughs> and, uh, well, yes, it is. <laughs> Get it out of but my face. What, what, what actually really killed me about that story was she thought she was immune to cobra, oh. you know, to any kind of venom. Because oh, she'd been oh. bitten so many times. And I did have this in, and it's one of the very, very few changes that Steve Rothman made. I mean, Tim, I think you'll agree, he did not edit much out. Correct. But maybe he thought this was in poor taste. 
but this this woman, this Grace Wiley of the Minneapolis Museum, had moved out west and was killed by a king cobra. Oh, no. And I looked it up. I thought, well, gee, I wonder what happened. And I found the headline in the newspaper was, and I'm trying not to laugh, Death proves woman cobra trainer wrong <laughs> on time needed for snake venom to kill. Wow. wow. Now, okay, maybe that would have been a cruel thing to put in there, but you got to admit it's a pretty ironic. That is pretty headline. good. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yep. Yep. Uh. You know, the other thing, and we didn't get into it, that I found particularly touching was the fact that when Bill married Seal, she wore his mother's wedding dress, and they got married on his parents' wedding anniversary. Oh, that's so nice. You know, and his father had been dead for like 16 years by that point. But oh. just it was just those little things that yeah. just really touched me. Well, and one of the other little things that we weren't going to include, but it was just a fun little factoid, was that uh, the the Baring Gould home on Aldrich Avenue is about three blocks from where Gary Thaden lives, also on Aldrich Avenue. Hmm. Oh, I think it's only about a block. It's not even. A, it's not even that far. Not even that far. Okay. Yeah. We should do a seance. It's really close. <laughs> You know what? Why don't we send Gary to do that? Gary, we've elected you. Good call. To stop at your neighbor's house. Well, that can be that you can know. be the theme of your next conference. I mean, it just flows from uh, from this past summer. 